Good morning to all from Florida International University in Miami. We welcome you to Religion, Ethics, the Environment and Public Policy, Care for Our Common Home, a symposium organized by the School of uh, International of Public Affairs, the Latin American Caribbean Center, and the Department of Religious Studies of this university. My name is Luis Guillermo Solis. I'm the interim director of the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center and former president of the Republic of Costa Rica. Today, we are welcoming you to the third session in a series of presentations that we have undertaken throughout the week that will continue tomorrow and uh, uh, on, on a number of very important issues pertaining the environment, integral development, and ecological conversion. Uh, this on the occasion of the fifth anniversary of the Laudato Si encyclica, one year after the Amazon Synod, and also as part of a larger reflection on the uh, role of religions in the keeping of our common home. Today we have uh, our featured speaker, uh, and after that a panel that will discuss his presentation as well as present other uh, ideas and, and opportunities to discuss this very important issue. Our guest, our feature speaker, is Father Augusto Sampini, who is the adjunct secretary of the Dicastery for the Promoting Integral Human Development at the Vatican. Father Augusto Sampini Davis was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Before entering the seminary, he studied law at the Catholic University in Argentina and worked as a lawyer at the Central Bank of Argentina and at the international law firm Baker and McKenzie. As a priest, he served in different parishes in, in, and institutions in Argentina and England. Trained as a moral theologian uh, at the Colegio Maximo, Universidad del Salvador, he holds a master's degree in international development at the University of Bath, where he was a Chevening scholar a doctor in theology at Roehampton University, London, as a Sacred Heart Scholar, and has been a postdoctoral research fellow at Margaret Beaufort Institute at the University of uh, Cambridge, where he was a Cardinal Hume Scholar. His area of expertise is moral theology with a focus on economic and environmental ethic. He's also an honorary fellow at Durham University, Roehampton University, and Stellenbosch University in South Africa and he's been lecturing since 2004 at different universities in Argentina and the UK. When Pope Francis created the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development in 2016, Cardinal Torxon invited him to be the coordinator of development and faith, an area dealing with economics and finance, labor and social movements, indigenous peoples and peace and new technologies. In 2018, Pope Francis appointed him as one of the experts and advisors to the signer of the Amazon in 2000, 2019. It is therefore with great pleasure and thanking him for contributing to our dialogue that I give the floor to Father Augusto Sampini Davis. Padre, usted tiene la palabra. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, Dr. Solis. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you and um, hope that you're listening. Are you hearing me okay? Yes? Excellent. Yes. So if I can, um, let me see, if I, want, I would like to start sharing a, a presentation, but before, let me, let me, let me, let me clarify um, something that it's, um, I don't know the, the high expectations, but I would like to share with you how from uh, the contributions of faith communities can help to change the way we conceive finance and we are addressing public policies in the current geopolitical situation and how spirituality therefore is, a, is a, one of the main drivers for this new uh, economic and political world that we need. So this is the aim of the lecture. So I don't want, I want you to Please apologize if there are some things that are obvious. Happy to discuss afterwards uh, with you uh, about that. 
Uh, but let me see if I can share the presentation uh, with you, if I can share the screen. Um, okay, well, otherwise I will just start speaking. Um, so, um, so, so f the first no the first uh, concept that I want to share with you is the concept that Pope Francis has uh, um, clarified in Laudato Si, that it's about uh, integral ecology. Now, integral ecology uh, before Laudato Si, that is the encyclical the letter of Pope Francis to all, everybody on the care for our common home, that is a social and ecological encyclical. Before that, the notion of integral ecology was quite disputed and contested, and rightly so, because ecology is a web of life. We don't need to put an adjective, no? What's, it's totally unreasonable, some uh, scientists were saying. In, ecology is ecology. We don't need to say, what does it mean integral, integral or integral? But Pope Francis explained it quite well. So he, sa he says, there are lots of people working on environmental issues uh, and conservation of nature. Um, and I praise them I mean, and, 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 and we, will, we are supporting them. But the, we cannot work on environmental issues, ignoring the main species that is the human, human being that is actually causing the environmental problems, but also we are part of the ecosystem. We are not outside the ecosystems. And on the other hand, there are a lot of people working on social issues in the favelas of San Pablo, no? or in, in the problems of migrants, but who, who don't seem to care about the ecological problems, as if the ecological problems uh, have nothing to do with the situation of poverty. And Paul Francis said, well, listen, this is, this ha they have to go hand in hand. They go together because the, uh, the roots of the ecological crisis that we are facing and the roots of the social crisis, mainly the uh, rising inequality and all, uh, and, and, and all the problems deriving from that, the roots are the same. So when he says the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor uh, have to be, will need to be listened and to addressed uh, together because the roots are the same. We cannot tackle one without tackling the other. Uh, and we know that uh, the ecological damage is affecting the poor, the poorest the most. Uh, an example is air pollution or access to drinking water, uh, uh, basic examples, or, the, uh, or access to food. But not just that, but everything. So, and, and it's even worse because normally the poor are the ones who contribute the least with the, the source of the ecological problem. And they are the ones who are affected the most. On the other hand, uh, caring for our common home, caring for our common is vital to promote social justice. So be, why? Because we cannot care for ourselves or life on earth if there's no earth, if there's no home. <laughs> so, so the notion of integral ecology is not just actually, I know that in the academia, the people were a bit surprised, but it has had what we call a very good reception. Do you know that documents, not just from the Pope, but even documents from academics or even in politics, no? and Dr. Solis knows very well this. I mean, documents or speeches, they have two channels. Now, one is when we write them and when we say things, and the other is the reception. This notion of integral ecology has, has been very well received, very well received. So even if we aren't, I mean, not necessarily agreeing with the tiny little details from an academic perspective, even the scientists that were disputing before, they said, no, this is what the Pope said, is, is okay, it's right. Because this transcends the language of biology, the language of sociology, and the language of mathematics. And they put them together, no? They, uh, and it's, 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 it's about our life, it's about uh, culture, it's about biodiversity, it's about personal life, it's about politics, it's about economics and finance. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, with the notion of integral ecology. And, and this is the basis upon which we want to promote this new universal solidarity, this new inclusive economics, this new finance that serves and not, and not rules the world, this new 
I mean, culture of encounter and not culture of indifference, etc. Um, is it is it is it okay that because I, I need, I'm sorry this it's obvious for some of you, but I think I have to clarify the where 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 I'm coming from and where the Pope is coming from this notion of integral ecology. What a shame that I cannot share the PowerPoint. Um, anyway, I will continue without PowerPoint. Perhaps it's even better. So the <laughs> the um, um, then the second thing I want to 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 say is now again to reinforce the integral ecological thing. This, it, this the way we treat the environment and the way we treat other people, they are so interconnected that even Pope, the, Pope, the Pope's predecessor of Francis, Benedict XVI, said that the way we treat one affects the way we treat the other and vice versa in a, in a document uh, called Caritas in Veritate. So, so if we want to promote inclusive finance, there's no way we can do it without this understanding of integral ecology, because otherwise the people will will continue working in silos without addressing the cause of the problem that is the, the same cause of, from the social and the ecological issues. So the second thing I want to say is about finance and the goodwill. So what kind of finance do we want to have? Because finance is needed. We know that finance is, uh, I mean, the way modern finance, of course, is a, a, a modern development that it's welcome, I would suppose, because if I want to build a new university, well, I cannot expect to have the money, the necessary money to build a new university without finance. You want, want to build a new church or a new hospital or develop a new vaccine for the COVID. So the, the financial instruments are, are something I would say is a good technological economic development with which we can, we can move, move ahead and, and achieve some goals. The problem is this, that because the word finance, as a Nobel Prize Robert Schiller explains, an expert in finance, he says uh, the word finance is commonly associated with the science and practice of wealth creation and wealth management, meaning enlarging portfolios, even in my imagination, man managing risks and tax liabilities, uh, among other things. But actually, the, the word finance should be associated with good wealth because finance is to create wealth to achieve goals. So is it good, the wealth that we are aiming at? Are the goals that we have using these financial instruments are goals that are improving society or not? So, and according to the social tradition of the church, good wealth comprises the use of resources to create and to share wealth and prosperity in sustainable ways not just to um, to have more or to or to add, or to increase our our um, economic income or to our national income is to i mean good wealth comprises again the resource to create and to share wealth and prosperity and the re and, and there are reasons to questions the current uh, financial model uh, because it's um, uh, with its global reach into every corner of society, very, very influential, because it's because we, the question is, is this financial model helping to, to promote social inclusion? Or is it helping to achieve the goals that more than 190 countries have decided that are the sustainable development goals, leaving no one behind, mm, creating a sustainable world? Is finance helping us to achieve those goals or, or is it not? So this is a question, and a very and uh, and and the question is 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 related to the common goals that we that where we can judge if our goals are are promoting a, a good wealth or not, and but moreover, everybody is somehow affected directly and directly by financial decisions that we have no control uh, over. And we suffer from a lack of adequate and reliable information. So there's another thing. So the gap between the poor and the rich is not just about um, about um, access to uh, food, access to health, about resources, about jobs, about money, as uh, uh, Thomas Piketty explains in, the, in his book. No, the, the inequalities is, is something bigger. But here is also is about the access to uh, to reliable information. If I, if my life or life of my community for example, if, I'm a, if I live in a community uh, that is surrounding a mining area, 
my entire life is affected for good or for ill by that mining industry. So why is it, is it, is it not unreasonable that don't have, I don't have any saying if this industry is affecting my life and who is financing that interest? Can I, can I speak with those people to explain? Do I have a, any saying or, 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 or do, we know, do I know about what, what was going to happen before the, the financial crisis in 2008, et cetera? So that this is also a part of the gap. And, um, um, and because it's difficult to predict the future financially and because finance has become a kind of the ruler of what the Pope calls real economics, it's even more difficult for people who are working in the real world to get access to this financial elite that, is, uh, that has become and most of my friends work in the, the financial. I used I used to be the lawyer of financial firms, so I'm not blaming anybody. But let's assume that they have become the the, the new power uh, 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 that 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 rules actually the, the global economic. So part of 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 this is if this is the finance that we, that can produce good wealth and that can include people in the taking decisions, then the sort of finance that we need is one, the sort of finance that finance the personal and collective goals that are aligned with the sustainable development goals that are that have been approved and proposed by more than 190 countries. Second, the democratization of finance is very difficult to uh, to talk about this because normally I find I find quite a resistance because uh, well, what does it mean by democratization of, of finance? Well, I mean that we need to create the financial industry is very creative and very fast so we need to create a way of including people who are excluded in the decisions that are taken and affecting their lives and um, so um, and this is what in normally the world economic forum you, you hear this well we have to go to a new economic model that is not the shareholder economics but the uh, but the stakeholder which i agree but yeah it's 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 a mix because yeah, I understand that if you're a shareholder of company, you have the, the first saying, but, but so what, what, what we are pushing for understanding of that, um, of that model that is proposed by in the secular world is yes, yeah, shareholders and, and stakeholders, actually they go hand in hand. What we have to, tr to try to transform is the, that the shareholders, they need to understand that the decisions that they take cannot be taken excluding the ones who are affected. So if, I'm, if I have a, 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 an industry that is affecting an entire town, I cannot take decisions without listening to that town, I mean, properly. And, and the same with finance. Now, if I'm affecting, if I'm investing in, in, a, in an industry that is affecting an entire world, well, there should be a kind of democratization of finance. And this is part of the transformation uh, that, we, that we are pushing forward. The other, the other thing of finance is um, is to to talk about the regulations. Of course, I, when people talk about finance, everybody talk about financial regulations. Yes, the financial regulations are are needed in order to well to help people to take these decisions, to include the excluded, to promote good economics, to promote good wealth, sorry, to promote a real economics, etc. But it's not enough, and we know that it's not enough. Regula regulations are just Regulations. Uh, what we need, what we need, is a change, and this is why I, I want to talk about faith. Regulations are just needed to show that we are going to work into towards that goal, toward that path. But it's not enough. What we need is a change of the financial culture and a change of the economic culture, which and we need to cultivate certain virtues in within the uh, business interest, industry, within the financial industry that faith, they can have a, a lot of things to say. For example, for example, um, if, if I'm a shareholder of, um, you know, I mean, any financial, um, in, in, in the financial industry, of, and, and, and my evaluation of success, it's only about the economic, the, the financial return, um, well, there is a problem because I'm, even, even from a mere economic perspective, I can say, well, but listen, this return that could be good in the next, in the short term, it could be lethal for the long term. And if you are, this is clear in the pension funds industry, if your idea is to, well, to, 
support the retired people and to create this and to keep this system alive, you need to think in the long term. And if we think in the long term, you cannot finance what is uh, destroying the long term with, uh, with a very short term mentality. We have this kind of discussions actually in the Vatican in one of when, when a, a leader of a, one of the biggest pension funds in the world was discussing with one of the leaders of the big oil and gas industry. And he was saying, listen, we are not going to finance you any longer if you don't change your industry. And the, and the, and the, and the reason is, is clear. We are, we are happy with what you do. We are happy with you as, 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 as part of uh, being a client of yours, but we are not happy with the way you are investing our money. And if you don't change, uh, if you don't change your industry, we, we won't be able to support you any longer because we are for the long term and, you, and your industry is not for the long term. If we fulfill the business plan of your company from all, and doing all the extractions that you are planning, that means that a rise of temperature in the planet of three, five, four, five degrees, which is unbearable for human beings. So we cannot afford that. We cannot tell our own clients that our own constituency. So that was a very interesting conversation that, that triggers the imagination and reveals a concrete discussion of what I'm saying to go, yes, the regulation is necessary, uh, but also we need to also to, to enter into the argument, the economic and financial argument. Finance, you know, the word comes from finish also. So it's about the end, it's about the goal. So what is the goal of economics? And, econ and oikonomos has the same root of oikologos, which is the administration of the home. First of all, it's about the life of the home. And if, if there's no life, if there's no home, there's nothing we can administrate. So this is something. So that's why the Pope is saying, I don't want an economy that rules. I don't want an economy that serves. I don't want an economy that kills. I want an economy that proposes development, but actual development, integral development, and, um, and so on and so forth. And, and finally, uh, if there, the financial crisis, the, sorry, the ecological crisis is enormous, and you know that, you are all experts, you know that, the, all leaders in the world know that. And one of the main challenges that we are facing at present is how do we implement the Sustainable Development Goals? We will say, how do we implement Laudato Si? We will, how do we change our lifestyle? How do we transform our en energy sources from energy that comes from heaven? from energy that comes from hell or from the Sheol or from the, from the, the bottom of the earth? How do we transform uh, our buildings? You know, how do we transform our way we commute, our way we eat, the production of food, the way we live, urbanization? It's massive. We cannot change it not overnight. We cannot change it on our own as a church, as a university, as a country. We need to do it. It's a common problem that requires common solutions. But, and a big but, uh, we, it, it needs a process, and in, in spirituality, we call it a, a conversion process. Conversion is a journey, an ongoing journey. The problem is that we don't have a lot of time. We are running out of time. So we need to put our focus on those things or activities or industries that can speed up the process of change and that can scale it up. So there are very, very few things that can really speed up and scale it up. Finance is one. Finance is really, really global. It's really, really fast. It's really, really innovative. So what we want to do, instead of blaming finance, we want to convince the financial industry through the investors, through, through investing in things that is possible, through divesting in things that are terrible for people on the earth, we, are going to, we want to create a massive movement of money from one place to the other so as to accelerate the change that is needed globally. This is one thing. But the other thing is, if you want to promote radical change, that the change that is needed is radical, is from the roots. This won't come from our head. Uh, ecologists have been talking about this since the 70s. I mean, people are, I mean, we have been discussing this for ages and still look at, look at the place uh, we are at the moment. Even in some countries, we're still discussing if, if this is true or not, which is absolutely absurd because it's a matter of fact, it's not a matter of opinion. So what happens is that, uh, but, but, but I don't want to blame other people. I, I would like to put, to put an example of myself. If you tell me Augusto has to, you have to stop being a priest, I'm going back to uh, the legal industry. Well, that's, that's a big change, isn't it? And I have to think about uh, a lot and I have to discern, I have to ask, 
it won't be easy. But even if you say, well, I'm not only that, but then you have to move from Rome to Sri Lanka. Well, that's even great. I mean, I, I won't be able to do it like this. I won't be able to, I won't be convinced even if all the University of Florida uh, convinced, uh, trying to convince me. <laughs> so what I, what I need is something that really is aligned with my deep values. So once my deep values are involved in this discernment process, then I can start transforming myself. This, that is a basic example of a spirituality or conversion, needs to be applied or can be applied or can be offered to the transformation in finance that, and in politics that we need. Because what is need, what needed is something that touch, touches us in a way that can produce radical change despite the fact that it's difficult and can sustain the change in, in time because then the difficulties come and then we, will, we will want to go back to business as usual. There's no place to go back to business as usual. An example is COVID now. No? People want to go back to Egypt in, in, in theology would say that is a story of the, Bible, the Old Testament. We want to go back to what we knew before even if, if, even if it was terrible. No, we don't need to go back to normal if normal was unjust, unfair, and unsustainable. What we want to do is to prepare a different future uh, despite the difficulties. Uh, and, and, we and we want to do it, and we will do it. And, and there's no road back. And for that, we need the two things, the three, I, will see, I would say the, the trilogy is the finance to speed up is a very good instrument to produce a new e economy. The second is politics. There's no way that we can change the world without good politics. There's no way. People are, I know that in my country, in Argentina, we are criticizing politicians all the time, and maybe rightly so, but that, what's the alternative? There's no way that we can do it without politics, without national, local, national, international politics. Politics, the Pope said, says in La Dato Si, and, and, and he mentioned it a couple of weeks before, is one of the highest expressions of love. Of, of course, as a highest expression of love can be uh, corrupted, can be denaturalized, but it's a highest expression of love because it's about the, the, the way we live in the polis and if we are a global village, it's a way, the way we organize this global village. So we need to focus on the financial world so as to speed up a good change and in good politics so that we can, well, we can promote a, kind of a healthier discussion than the one we are having at present for a healthier future. So, uh, but for that, these two things won't happen without a very strong spiritual approach. I'm not saying spiritual so that nobody can accuse me that I'm trying to impose my religion. It could be other spiritualities, but spirituality is something that is deep down below here. It's connected with faith, with reason. It's not disconnected, but it comes from, 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 from deep down below and, it, and it, it captures three dimensions of human beings. One is the iconic uh, dimension, the way we contemplate. If we cannot contemplate the goodness of somebody or the goodness of the earth, we cannot take care of the person or of the earth. In, in Spanish, we would, would say, I don't know if you remember, no? uh, well, that, that, that uh, el amor no es ciego, no? love is not, <laughs> it's not blind. You have to see because otherwise you cannot, even if a person that is a blind person is to touch, but you need to to be related to the to people and to and to the earth so as or to contemplate it to, so as to love them and to care for and for that you need a, a different approach to time a different approach to to a, a different mentality of extracting culture utilitarian mentality to a relational culture and and a, and a self giving mentality the second dimension of the of the person is the the commonality of, uh, of liturgies. Liturgies could be rituals, could be not just the religious one, but mainly the religious ones. Look at what we're doing. I mean, 80% of the population of the world claims to be spiritual or religious. And, and, and what's going on? So there's something, because in the rituals, the anthropological studies sh show that in the rituals, we can go out of our own self because it's a common space. And one of the main problems of this of, a, of the modern era is individualism individualism can be personal or collective but so the lead, the rituals help us to go out the good rituals of course then the rituals help us to uh, link the, uh, the the time 
from the past with the future and, and, and I'm not blaming everything and not, or ignoring or not having memories. It's bringing the memory to the present with the hope of the future. And it's about change. It's not just about the moment of, of the we celebrate. And rituals can capture these uh, dimensions of this, uh, of anthropological dimensions, good rituals, and put it at the service of good finance, good politics. And finally, spirituality can also help us to recover uh, the, the virtue of living simply, no? the, the virtue the, of, of, um, of being ascetic, no? and, um, of, and that could, could change the, I mean, the, the, the understanding of the development of the person and of communities that having more and more and more. So I, this is new, this is, this is really, really new in the history of humankind, that we think that we are better if we have more, more, and more. Uh, this less is more is something very difficult even to understand, even for, even for me, that I'm involved in these issues. Uh, but the indigenous people understand it, and lots of people understand it. So we need to understand, when if less is more, how do we create a, a, a way of measuring success in finance and economics that can reveal that something more than accumulation? Because if we, can, if we are able to do that, we will be able to change the understanding of economics as extracting things from the earth, producing more, and then we have to, to crush them. And so can we not change the model of saying, how do we humans need to develop with the earth in order to develop sustainably? And how can we finance that transition to that radical change in the development economic model? For that, again, and I will finish so we can enter into the discussion, we need good finance, focus on the goals of society, good politics, focus on the way we, we dialogue in society, and, uh, and, and good uh, spirituality that is serving both the economic, financial, and the political and cultural world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Sampini. We have been hearing the presentation of Father Augusto Sampini Davis, who is the adjunct secretary of the Dicasteri for the promotion of integral human development in the Vatican. Before I give the, the word, la parole, to my good friend, uh, Professor Whitney Bauman, I would like to ask you, Father, to expand uh, in an, an idea you just presented a few minutes ago regarding the relationship between religion and politics, which is very much present in Latin America, and it is present today in the debates uh, throughout the United States and Europe in our own region. Um, I'd like you to, to, to give us an idea of what's the, the correct balance. Uh, I, I recall Jesus' words before Pilate, give to God what's God's, give to the, to the Caesar to what's, to, to, to what's the Caesar, give God's what's God's. Uh, so there is a, an acknowledgement that there is a division between the the, the stewardships of the two worlds, of the spiritual world and of the earthly uh, world, between uh, spiritual responsibilities and politics. But yet there is this very strong need, and I say this as a politician who is also a believer, the, of our commitment, as, as in my case, a Catholic and a Christian, with, with our own principles and values and, and interact in the interaction between both. What, how, how should this question be addressed and what's the limit, limit between good politics and good religion and bad ones. Thank you for the idea. That's a, a good question. I, I think that actually going back to the to the to the passage of the Bible that you quote, well, it's, it's a bit contested the interpretation that is a strict division because Jesus was referring to the power of Caesar and to the um, in, but um, and, and and to the coin that was the exactly. coin was the the the, the, the 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 image of the Caesar and and not God and so it's 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 very interesting this this debate but let's let's keep it simple let's go there is some distinction I would say of of course doing politics is not necessarily a religious activity, and even people who don't believe can participate, and that's totally le le legitimate. And in the past, we have experienced the problems when religion and the theocratic societies, are, well, were not, were not necessarily the best societies no? in, the, in the history of humankind. 
However, one thing is to distinguish, uh, and this is, could, we could take, we, arguably we could say that this is a good development in, on, on modern society, this distinction, so that everybody can participate. However, uh, there's no division, because, uh, particularly in, by well, most religions, I would say, but especially in Christianity, because the principle of incarnation, I mean, everything that is human is related to God, since God has assumed human humankind. But also the, 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 the message that Christ brings is the message of the kingdom of God. Of course, it's a kingdom that transcends local politics or temporal politics, but it's a kingdom of justice, it's a kingdom where the last are the least. It's a kingdom where everybody can eat. You know, the, the parable of the multiplication of food. It's a kingdom where debts are forgiven and people can resume. It's a kingdom where uh, of jobs, where jobs are available and, and people are paid the necessary to live, even if they, they start with at the last hour. It's a kingdom where of of mercy, of inclusion, of of love, I mean, and that kingdom, of course, will appear perfectly in the, at the end of times. But this is our mission to start creating that kingdom now. And this is always related to the way we organize the police. I mean, we, we cannot ignore that. We could distinguish, and, and sometimes we have to, and sometimes, but in a, in a healthy society, we should be able to do it without imposing our faith, because this is the limit for, for me. I mean, when the, your, your question was about that. The limit is, politics should not be used to impose our, our faith, because this is, not, this is also not our mission. Our mission is to, to evangelize, to transmit this kingdom of God, uh, even to the people that they don't agree with us. Because this, if, look, at, look at what we are doing now with the coronavirus. Uh, trying to fight for a, a vaccine for all. Well, most, I mean, there's a lot of people who will accept, even if they're not religions, trying the things about the, uh, the uh, not, we don't have to invest in, uh, in, in, our, in armaments, especially in nuclear armaments or biological armaments. Now, trillions of dollars today, uh, in, in a time where we need to invest in public health. Look, well, many people would agree with that. You don't need to be, look at what's happening in uh, this economic economy that cannot be merely material. Yes, the economy has to be material, but has to include other dimensions of humanity because the homo economicus doesn't exist and will never exist <laughs> because people that are not just utilitarian people who are always wanting the better for, for a particular moment. That, that, that person, I've never met that person. So if, if that person doesn't exist, why, why don't we change the model of it? that we are using in a common. And most people, will, and lots of people will agree with that, that they don't need to share our faith. The same with solidarity, subsidiarity, etc. cetera. They, they care for the earth. So what I'm saying is that it's very difficult to be a Christian without, by being indifferent from the way the society is organized and the way particularly is affecting the, the last, the weakest, the poor, the sick, the excluded, the marginalized, the migrants. And the ones are in prison, no? because th those are where all the messages of Christ. No? And every time you, you, you meet one of these persons, you, you meet me. So, the, so it's very difficult for a Christian community, not just for an individual, to live the faith without, by, by being totally detached from that. And for some reason, the Pope, Pope Francis, in a document that is called Evangelii Gaudi on the Joy of the Gospel in 2013, he explained something that we were debating, and people were, some people, and still is some people they don't understand, even, the, even though the Pope, not just this Pope, a previous Pope, they have emphasized that the promotion of human development, the promotion of the a proper development of human beings and community, communities is a task, is a mission of all the church, not just of a group of people in Caritas, or justice and peace, or in, in my dicastery, or in your department in Florida. It's a, it's a group of all the communities. Every community has different, well, talents and, and different groups, but the promotion of, of the person and the care for people and the care for creation is a task of the entire community. So it's very difficult to say, we are going to care for people and care for the earth and ignoring politics or ignoring economics or ignoring the financial decisions, because it's impossible. 
everything is interconnected. The way we are, the, the political decisions are taken, the way financial decisions, decisions are taken, the way uh, we, we produce, we consume, we waste, uh, have a, a, a clear effect on people's life. So we cannot be indifferent about that. So this is why, of course, there's no dogma about that. There's no one way of doing it. That's why we need to do it in dialogue. But the involvement in politics is a, one of the highest expression of love. And we have to, this is not an imposition because we don't have a particular political understanding. Because if you're a Catholic, you can be, you can be Catholic for different, uh, you and belong to different political parties. There's no a Catholic party but there are Catholic values that can be promoted. This is very important because some people, I know that now in the US, you cannot be a Catholic and vote for that. You cannot be a Catholic. Well, hold on a minute. Who says that? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the problem is the values that you are, that you are uh, giving priority to. What are the values that are giving priority? Of course, there are values, there are always priorities and competing values. We, I have competing values in my life every day. The problem is what do I need to put uh, uh, in, in the first place at, at present. Well, in my opinion, at present is the most important crisis that we have, we have had in, since, since, since we were born and since we, we exist in, in the earth. That is for the first time in history, we are destroying the source of our, of our economics, the source of our politics, of our finances, the source of our life. That is the earth, our mother earth that hosts us. So we need to change the way we're living in order to we need to reset to start again. And this requires a new politics and requires all parties, but this is not, a, but we have some values that are very, very, um, how to say, I would say relevant at present to, to bring into the discussion. Uh, and, and of course, the more concrete you are, the more debatable and the less dogmatic and the less, well, this is not how my religion, but this is what, the social tradition of the church is about. We start in the modern in the modern age with the problem of work and capital because people were working 24 hours a day, irrespective of the, of the age and etc. And we said, no, no, this is this cannot happen. And well, how? Well, we'll see. But the same with every single uh, social or ecological aspect. So I think it's very difficult to to say they are completely separate. What, is, what we can say is that they, we can distinguish it. Yes, to Caesar, because if the coin belongs to Caesar, this is Caesar. And God is always above Caesar, <laughs> because it's not just about a coin. But that doesn't mean that we cannot propose values from the kingdom of God that can be shared with other religions and with even non-believers to current politics. I don't know if you answered the question. Recently. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Father. And without any further delay, allow me to give the floor to my colleague and distinguished professor at FIU, Whitney Bauman from the Department of Religious Studies, who will be the moderator for the next session. I want to remind you that we are interpreting these sessions into Spanish and Portuguese. You can turn into your interpretation using the icon in the lower right-hand side of your screen. Whitney, thank you very much, and the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you so much, um, and thank you for that introduction. I think I just got a promotion from you, so distinguished professor, that's great. Um, it's very nice to be here with all of you today, and um, I thank you so much, uh, Father Zimpini. That was a wonderful, wonderful lecture, and I was reminded a little bit from uh, one, of the, uh, one of the comments yesterday that was made by one of our, our speakers was about this notion of apocalypse and how apocalypse is an uncovering. It's a revealing of something new also, so it's not just a an end to things, but it gives us an opportunity to sort of reattune to a new world that might be emerging in this sort of thing. So, hopefully, um, hopefully, in, in all of this, in all of this uh, shifting due to climate change and globalization, we can we can begin to reattune to a, a new a new possible world uh, in this sort of thing. Um, since today we'll be talking a little bit about um, conversion, I thought that might be appropriate. Um, also, we are going to hear now from Dr. Fernando Sanchez, who I think will have something to say also about the way in which uh, Laudato Si has been used um, as a tool for helping people to reattune to the realities of, of climate change all the world over. Um, I work with some colleagues, for instance, at the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University, Maryland Tucker and John Grimm, and they have been 
uh, part of Paris Accord. Uh, they were part of the Paris Accords uh, conference and they said that Laudato Si was one of the most important documents at the Paris Accord conference for getting, um, for getting some consensus uh, from different countries uh, around the world to, to sign on to these, um, uh, these accords. So um, just, just some little notes there, but let me introduce now our next panelist. We have uh, one panelist with us right now. There's some connection issues for uh, the other panelists, so we might have more time for conversation. We're just gonna play this by ear. Um, but we do have with us right now, um, Dr. Fernando Felipe Sanchez Campos, and he has served in the public sphere as a diplomat representing the Republic of Costa Rica as ambassador to the Holy See of the Vatican, to the Sovereign Order of Malta, and to the Sovereign Order of Malta. He's also worked with UN agencies, um, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and the World Food Program. In addition, he was elected as a deputy to the Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica by popular election, where he presided over several commissions, including the Permanent Commission on Social Affairs and the Special Permanent Commission on International Relations and Foreign Trade. He's currently the rector of Catholic University of the Catholic University in Costa Rica. And he's written and edited several books and articles, um, some of which he will, might mention today. And he's been a champion of promoting Laudato Si as a basis for transforming education uh, and the university system. And if I have this correct, the uh, one of the only sort of observatories that's devoted to, to, to sort of measuring how Laudato Si is at, uh, at your university. And you might, you're gonna say something more about that uh, to us today. So without further ado, let me just welcome you and you have the floor for uh, for your time, 15, 15 minutes or 20, thanks. All right, well, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Solis, uh, for your invitation. And Father Sampini, it's always nice to see you, and it's always interesting that we see each other in this kind of activities, so that means we're doing something good. <laughs> uh, President Solis, thanks a lot for this invitation. Um, I'm happy to know that I have a little bit more time Yesterday, I was trying to put everything in 15 minutes. It was almost impossible, but I'll try. I'll do my best. And now I'm ready to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in English uh, because I believe it will be better, but in any, any case, it, uh, somebody who have some questions in Spanish, I'll be happy to answer them as well. Um, today we're going to talk, as Professor Barman was saying, about La the Laudato Si Observatory and the Humanistic Integral Ecology Index. Um, I'm going to call this, this is a very long, complicated name, from, so from now on we're going to talk about just our index. Um, everything started as uh, Father Sampini and President Solis will remember, in 2017, when we organized in Costa Rica at the Universidad Católica, the seventh International Symposium of the Ratzinger Foundation. And uh, we gathered around 800 people from 24 different uh, countries to discuss Laudato Si and uh, its implications. The main um, results that we have from that uh, event were a book that you can see there, Laudato Si, de la Casa Común, una conversión necesaria a la ecología humana, where, by the way, we have contributions by President Solis and by, by Father Sampini, and I'll be happy to, to send a copy to whoever I use a library if, if necessary. And it was handed to the Holy, Holy Father a couple of years ago. He was very pleased with the results. And the second one is the creation of La, the Laudato Si Observatory that is basically working in this humanistic ecology index that we're, that we're going to discuss today. What is this index? Well, as Father Sampini was saying before, what we're trying to do here is saying, well, uh, the Holy Father got lots of positive reactions and support when he published uh, Laudato Si. However, we wanted to know whether this was a real support based on public policy changes or reforms or was it just a general, quote unquote, diplomatic support? And in order to prove that, we decided to do something that was a little bit, to say the least, interesting at the moment. That was to use an index and try to measure whether countries were actually 
okay, and their public policy was actually reflecting what the Pope was saying in Laudato Si. So the index measures the social and ecological development of nations based on the encyclical. It's based on an open and balanced dialogue between the postulates of Laudato Si and the socioeconomic variables that academia uses to measure human progress. And it is, it is a pastoral and an academic analysis of the reality based on the encyclical. In terms of the scale, it goes from one to, ten, to 100. The higher the value, the closer the country is to what Laudato Si is saying, the lower the value, the further away the country is to Laudato Si's postulates. Uh, this has been a joint effort, I have to say, of experts in development and theology from our university, from Incaia Business School, uh, from the Latin American Center for Competitiveness and Sustainable Development, Viva Trust, the Social Progress Imperative, etc. etc. Okay, very, very fast, and I'm, I'm not getting into the statistics because it will take lots, lots of time. But the index is made out of two pillars, four dimensions, and more than 50 indicators. The first one, a social one, we named it Come Good. It has two dimensions, collective well-being, and how efficient a country is in converting economic growth into collective welfare, where, by the way, institutions are central. The second one is an ecological pillar. We named it care of our common home. And the first I mentioned is environmental performance. The second one, environmental balance or environmental footprint. The analysis is designed at the country level, but it can be applied at the level of regions, counties, dioceses. And we are dreaming and working and trying to take it to the family level. That's a big challenge at the moment. When we want to see how Laudato see our families are. Okay, up to now we have two studies, 2017 and 2019. 119 countries evaluated. They were divided in seven different regions and they represent more or less 92% of the world population. Okay, this is how the index looks like. As I was saying, I'm not getting into detail, but this is the, that's the index, the first pillar, common good. We have two dimensions, collective well-being, when we have basic human needs, nutrition, basic medical care, water, sanitation, etc. Foundations of well-being, access to basic knowledge, access to information, communication, access to opportunity, personal rights, personal freedom, inclusiveness, etc. And then the efficiency or how efficient a country is in converting economic growth into general well-being. On the other part, we have our ecological pillar, care of our common home, with two dimensions. Environmental performance, ecosystem vitality, water resources, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, biodiversity, etc., and environmental health, impact of the environment on human health and air quality. And finally, environmental balance, the relationship between total consumption and the capacity of nature to regenerate in a year. Uh, the, the statistics of this will take us probably a whole, a whole morning. Um, and that's not the idea today. We're going to talk about some results. Let's see some global data analysis. First, in terms of countries. By the way, I'm going to skip the quotes of Laudato Si because otherwise it will be impossible to finish on time. Um, if we were to see the world as a country, what would the score be? Well, in 2017, it was 52.3. And in 2019, it's better a little bit to 53.2. We got better results both in the common good uh, pillar as in the care of a common good pillar. Obviously, these are pre-pandemic uh, uh, results. Uh, we are now working on the results after the pandemic and probably things will look a little bit different. Um, this, this is how the world looked in 2017 in terms of our index. The greener, the better, the redder, the worst. Uh, see how green uh, in terms of the index, that means high scores, our continent America had at the moment, at that moment. We see also Europe, uh, very green position, Asia, yellowish, and some red 
quite important red in Africa, Australia green as well. Uh, if we move two years afterwards, there will be 2019. Sorry for that. Let's see if it's low. Okay. We see that the world is turning a little bit more yellow. Our continent, not as green as before. Asia, more or less the same. Europe, less green. Uh, but basically, we are seeing more yellow and less green and more or less the same amount of red. What does that mean? terms of results. Well, they were presented a slight improvement, 52.3 to 53.2. However, that is a medium low score in our, in our scale, which means that the world would be considered to be an unbalanced, you know, unbalanced in terms of Laudato Si. That means doing good in some indicators and variables and not as good in other ones. The world would be, generally speaking, orange. 65 countries improved between these two years, 54 got worse results, while in 2017, 80 countries were above the world average. In 2019, 78 countries were above the world's average. Guatemala and Indonesia didn't make it in the second uh, study. This is the ranking. Everybody wants to see the ranking. Um, we see Finland in the first place, um, and it's the, not only the first one, first place overall, but in Europe and Central and the Central Asian region. We see New Zealand fourth and is the first in the East Asia and Pacific region. Canada is the first American country and the first in the North American region. And we have to move all the way to number 23 to find the first Latin American country and the first in the Latin America and the Caribbean region will be Costa Rica. Um, we have nothing to do with that. Uh, that's how the results turn out to be. We see Israel in 25. That's the first in the Middle East and North Africa region. And if you were wondering, because I know somebody was going to ask, you see the United States in number 31, right here. Um, what other, you can, you can also use this index and you can use it in a number of ways to illustrate also inequality. See the difference between the North American region that is in the first place, uh, especially because of how well Canada is doing, and the South Asia region, there's a, almost a 26 difference between both regions. And let's see how, what happens at the country level. You see Finland and Chad for 2019, that's 44 points, a 44 point difference between those two countries. Um, obviously, you can get into lots of detail and start asking questions about why and which variables we are doing well, which got worse. And that's, that's the kind of, of work that we have to do after this general aggregated results. Um, our index ranks countries, not their population, but clearly what countries do has an impact on the on their people. And that's exactly what the Pope is asking us to do when we analyze and, and try to apply uh, Laudato Si in practice. So again, this is the world's map in 2017 in terms of billions of people living in different countries, because obviously it's not the same the score, for example, of China with any other country in the world in terms of how many people are impacted by policy in each country. See how red the world was in 2017, especially as I was saying, China, India, a little bit of green there, and some, some not only low red, but very strong red in 2017. When we move to 2019, you see, again, the world in terms of population and our index is turning yellowish. Uh, China turned uh, orange, and that changed things a little bit. For example, um, we just maybe before doing that, uh, we consider uh, high or very high, uh, uh, the score of high or very high uh, to reflect acceptable living conditions in terms of Laudato Si. Medium low or low unbalanced conditions and low and very low unacceptable living conditions in terms of Laudato Si. So between 2017 and 2019, you see that more people, almost 5%, are living in conditions that will be considered acceptable according to Laudato Si, and that's good. In terms of unbalanced conditions, there was a big increase. That's a 22.2 .2 increase. And that's basically because China went 
from low in 2017 to medium low in 2019. Still hanging in there in the right, uh, moving in the right direction, but still much to be done this, this, in, this, in this bunch of countries. Uh, but the, the bad news is, even if it went down 26.7%, still we have uh, 30, almost 30% 30 of the world's population living in conditions that will be considered unacceptable according to the Pope and Laudato Si. Again, we can go forever here in different kinds of analysis. Uh, just a quick note before get, going back to, to some conclusions on the importance of networking. Uh, networking is key uh, to take full advantage of, of, of the possibilities we have with our index. Not only is it, is it consistent with what the Pope is requesting us to do, it expands knowledge and the sense of working together on comprehensive solutions. It generates greater capacity for analysis and work. It allows for an in-depth for in-depth studies at the country or regional levels and for analysis of key variables. And that's something we're asking our, our partners to do in their own countries or in their own regions. Uh, also, it expands support in the design of public policy for nations and international organizations because one of the main implications of, of these um, measurements is to illuminate uh, on how we can change policy. Uh, the Laudato Si Observatory has taken advantage of the strength of networking, and we are already working with IFCU, that's the International Federation of Catholic Universities. We have 2020 universities there. We are already working with ODUCAL, que es la Organización de Universidades Católicas de América Latina y el Caribe. We are at around 105 universities there. With RUC, la Red Universitaria para el Cuidado de la Casa Común, we are like 20, 25 Latin American universities, and obviously, with the Ratzinger Foundation, and always open to new partnerships and new ideas on how to move forward with this uh, interesting tool we're working with. Um, some final remarks. I believe I'm still on time. Um, well, our index measures how close or far away nations are from the postulates that Pope Francis established in his encyclical letter, Laudato Si basically trying to, uh, to measure or to, to see whether countries actually were reflecting what he's asking us to do in the policy. The index is made out of two pillars, common good, social aspects, and care for common home, the ecological aspects. Each of them with two dimensions that integrate more than, than 50 variables. Uh, the 2019 study considered 119 countries or that cover around 92% of the world's population, that's almost 7 billion people. In 2019, 30% of the world's population, more than 2 billion people distributed in 26 different countries, live in conditions that will be considered unacceptable, according to Laudato Si. In 50, almost 51% of the world's population, more than 3.5 billion people distributed in 59 different countries, lived in conditions that will be considered unbalanced, still not there in the right in the right direction, but still not there, according to Laudato Si. And almost 20% of the world population, more than 1.3 billion people distributed in 34 different countries, different conditions will be considered acceptable, according to Laudato Si. Hence, more than 80% of the world population, 5.6 billion people distributed in 85 different lived in conditions that would be considered unacceptable or unbalanced in terms of the encyclical. Clearly, um, clearly, there is a long way to go in a global ecological conversion process. And this is remarked and stated and remembered again and again by the Holy Father. I still remember when I listened to his first address to the Holy, to the diplomatic force at the Vatican after his election, and he basically proposed he makes his main ideas. And when he talked about the environment and about climate change, I still remember this phrase uh, that I would like to share with you. He said, uh, dear ambassadors, we can say today, dear academics, students, God always forgives. We sometimes forgive, but when nature, creation, 
is mistreated, she never forgives. Um, I'm gonna leave it like that. Uh, I hope I was able to do it in the time that was stipulated, I believe I did, uh, that was very complicated. Um, I know probably that there will be lots of questions because this is not a, it's a, it's a very complex tool we're working with and I'll be happy to answer any, any of them. Uh, if uh, somebody has any questions, either in English or in Spanish. Thanks uh, again for this invitation and for the possibility of showing the world, basically, the work we've been doing in the last, um, in the last three years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was wonderful um, and, and super informative. And also, um, Archbishop uh, Wazinski ended with that same quote yesterday when he was speaking. So. Um, um, it's yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Um, so we do have, I wanted to let the uh, participants know, we do have time. We have about uh, uh, 19 minutes for questions and answers. So please, in the bottom of your uh, Zoom pr uh, profile, there's a little Q&A thing, and you can, um, you can pose questions, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, one of the questions that actually came up, there is a question here already, and this is for both of you. Um, um, is, is how do we explain wealth redistribution to those that feel offended by this concept? So one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking and showing the, the different sort of indices for the Human Integral Ecology Index was I was also thinking of this, um, you know, the image of the champagne glass economy that was so popular during uh, Occupy Wall Street and what a connection there is between this gross economic inequity and ecological devastation. And I was wondering if you could say you either of you, both of you want to say anything more about that? Like, how, how do you deal with that? Um, especially in some place like where, like Miami, right? Where, where anything that sounds like common good is sort of shy, is people shy away from it, you know, this sort of thing. Well, our, our basic aim, one of the basic aims we had when we started working with, with, this, um, with this index, well, the first thing we had to do was to work together with theologians and Expert economists and, uh, and experts on development as well. That was quite quite complicated, as you could imagine. It took like a month just to get clear the terms that we were going to use. Um, and then we, we went to that very question, and and, and the, the first conclusion was, okay, GDP is not enough. By all means, it's not enough. We need to find new ways of measuring well-being, whatever however you 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 understand well-being. And, and we saw in Laudato Si the perfect tool, the frame to do that. Because if, if, if we go back to the encyclical, it has a very systemic position analysis for culture, politics, economy, social development, ecological development are all integrated, all with human development. So that's why we chose this, this let alone my personal um, religious positions. Um, we chose this, this Laudato Si because it was perfect for what we wanted to, to, to do. And we, uh, at the very end, it's very interesting because if you see the second dimension of the common good or the common good uh, pillar, it's how efficient a country is in turning its GDP, basically, its, its economic growth, into welfare, into well-being. So we're, we're not saying that it is, it's not important to, to, to grow economically. No, you have to grow because you have to. Otherwise, why are you going to distribute? <laughs> uh, you have to grow. But the thing is, if you are willing to distribute first, and second, how are you willing to do it? And the big conclusion that we, at least in these two first uh, studies, was that the more, the better, the stronger institutions a country has, the better the country is in redistributing uh, well, so there's a there's a political question to that. There's a political, basic political question to that. Um, if you have strong institutions uh, that last over time, that can go over the period of government four, five, six years, with clear objectives, uh, then it's easier to redistribute uh, wealth. You have to create wealth first to to be able to redistribute that, but you need also the institutions. So there's a political question to this, to this pillar as well, uh, that is central, is central. That's why 
I mean, today it was not possible to go into the, the into detail, but if we, if we went into the, you know, a country analysis, for example, it would be very interesting. And that's what we are asking our, our, our colleagues to do in other universities. Well, choose a country, choose your country, choose your region, and see how well you're doing in terms of this index and why. What are the key variables to you doing badly or, or, or doing well, and how can they be better? Uh, but the basic framework is Laudato Si. So, um, and, and obviously, uh, as I was saying before, we, we, we started from that general applause, the world, well, with some, <laughs> with some uh, exclusions, but generally, the world applauded uh, Laudato Si. And so we wanted to say, okay, you're, you're willing to, are you really willing to support what the Pope is saying? Is your public policy reflecting what the Pope is asking us to do? Are you willing to take the, st the steps forward to, um, to be close to what the Pope is asking us to do, to do in Laudato Si? Or was just only just a big diplomatic uh, empty applause that there's no way of reflecting that on your public policy? So yes, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, uh, that's, <laughs> that's something that I wanted to, to say. You know, one of the things that I learned uh, at Isaac Catolica and uh, at my meetings with rectors is that we end up speaking of whatever we want, rather than what we are asked. So I'll try to, I'll try to, to answer all the questions, but I still have lots of things to say about, about this work we're doing in Costa Rica. Thank you. Father Zampini, did you want to add anything? Just the, the um, what, I, what I would ask is coming from a more uh, religious perspective or a pastoral perspective, or uh, I would, counter and uh, counter ask why are people i mean like jesus does in the gospels why are people upset because we are promoting the common good i mean i would i would question that i mean it's, it's like the people this is the same question that he asked at the end of the parable of the the the, the workers of the vineyard why are you uh, angry because i am because i am doing good things <laughs> so why, why, is it because the common good requires to go outside yourself, outside your vested interest for the benefit of others? And if that upsets you, well, that's the problem. Not, the problem is not the common good notion. The problem is because the, this upsets you. The, you. We have to question that. Why is it upsetting you that we want to create a, wealth, a wealthier and healthier society for all? And then, then I can imagine the answer. The answer, well, but I deserve because I have worked all day. And, and, and he or she they, 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 uh, hasn't worked all day. The same of the parable, the same, you see? Well, hold on a minute. So this is, this is, a, this is a problem of spirituality, it's not just economics. The redistribution, well, it's not about redistribution. It's about some people have more capacity to achieve what they want to achieve, to, give, to live good lives. Some have very little capacity. Now it happens that the ones we have the capacity, we are creating a lot of problems with, not because we are evil, but because with the model that we, we are based upon our own wealthy development. So this has to question ourselves, first of all, if we, because if, if, if the cry of the poor doesn't touch us enough, at least we should question, hold on a minute, the thing that I am, I have a good life and the others are, are, haven't, are not having a good life, but the model is helping me and not the others. We, why don't we question the model? So that this was a basic question on justice. I mean, people have been striving to answer this question. I mean, even John Rawls is arguably one of the most, uh, or the best thinkers in the 20th century about justice. This was in a nutshell his question. I mean, how can we <laughs> create a system where everybody can thrive? I mean, so it's not, it's not something totally new so for me, the question is, why are you so upset? Because we want to, in, in, uh, to improve the lives of those who are, who are miserable. Who wants, why, why are you upset? Because we want to include those who are included. Why, 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 is, why is wrong with you? Why, because why, why are you upset? Because migrants are coming. Well, what, what do you want them to do? If you were in that position, you will do the same, or probably even you were worse. Why do we create a system where they can work legally so they, 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 we can create jointly the worth with 
Is it, I mean, Argentina was doing that in the, in, at the beginning of the 19th century at, at, with, with good results. I mean, so, so the, for me, as a Christian, I would counter argue, why are you upset? Because this is the question that Jesus has asked to the people that were upset when he was preaching these things. So again, why are you upset? Because uh, Fernando Sanchez and the Catholic University of Costa Rica wants to develop a new system to measure success. What, what is wrong with you? Because actually the way we are measuring success is not working. We have to change. Perhaps it's not the best. It's a work in progress, as he mentioned. We have to improve it, yes, but the other is not working. It's not working at all. This thing that we, we increase, 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 and we think that we are, and, and we are happy about that. And while our people are crying out, no, the, the model is not working. We need to change the model. Now, of course, nobody knows what's the new model is. So there are two ways of changing the model. Either we're changing a revolution, but the revolution never helps the poor, or history shows that, or we change it through a cultural revolution, through a spiritual revolution through changing models with really, I mean, solid uh, commitments from people that, uh, that owns companies, that, own, that are leaders in working unions, that are leaders in, in, in academia, that are leaders in social issues, that are leaders in religion that say, no, let's find together a different model that is more inclusive and sustainable. Because again, the inclusiveness is not, is not enough because otherwise, for example, with the jobs. Now, millions of people have lost their jobs now with the COVID millions all over the world well what jobs are we going to promote because this is the time to create the new jobs that we need this is the time we cannot go back and create the jobs that were not very i mean human and certainly polluting jobs let's call it and because then we have to go back again so this is the time that when we have to generate new things and this is the time that we need to create new opportunities another example uh, how, why, in regards, regarding jobs, and this is in all societies, we discovered in the COVID that there's a lot of activities that are not remunerated by society, or they're not measured, like uh, Dr. Sanchez said, uh, but are key for the, for the surviving of society, caring for the elderly. Well, is it, how are we going to remunerate as a society? This is a question that even Plato was asking in ancient Greece. So it's not, I mean, there are basic questions of humanity, philosophical questions. How are we going to remunerate those who, those who create value in society? Suddenly we discover that some people who are creating value, carers of elderly people, the people who, who collect the, the, our, our, our rubbish, our garbage, you see? The, the nurses, uh, well, suddenly we discover that are very, very valuable for society. Well, mm, is it not wrong that their that their remuneration? You see how are, so new jobs, the technology. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. Let's assume there's no road back technology. So, and and jobs will become uh, actual jobs for ordinary people will, will become less. So how can and we are going to work lesser hours. So how what are we going to do with the rest of the hours? How so how can we create a system where the the extra hours is not in an office, but is to create value for the commons, you see? So this is the time to resume, again, it's not new, but it's a new approach. The discussion, even within economic, economic discipline, about the question of value. But the question of, of, of value was a, was a question in, 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 in the 19th century in, in liberal economics. So, for example, the question was, well, a priest, does a priest create value? Or not? And the answer was not because they conceive value as a create, creating something materially. So the, the priest is, is a kind of waste of time for the society because he doesn't create anything. So, well, uh, so he doesn't create value. Well, but now we have to, with all this new understanding of humanity, psychology, neuroscience, sociology, with all the development of humanity, it is time to, to see how can we uh, absorb the creation of value, particularly the public value, and remunerate it uh, accordingly. But for that, we need new measures of success, new measures of growth. And this is what the University of Costa Rica is, tra is, is trying to do. And I encourage all other universities to do it because we need this. Another example concrete, to just to, to put it a concrete example so people don't accuse me of. Um, so in India, for example, in the, in the Hindu religions, uh, something very, very important is to prepare the body 
no, to be cremated and throw it to the Ganges. Well, this is a very important, valuable job. Total, I mean, normally it's very, very badly remunerated, almost ignored, and it's, it's done by the, low, by the lowest caste. Well, you see, so this is key for the society. So how can something that is key for the value of the society be so, I mean, undervalued? If it, so this is, these are the things that we need to, to, to decide, of course. Um, uh, I know that there are philosophical questions behind, I know that it's not simple, but at least from the faith perspective, at least we need to be, like the, the Pope likes to say, be, um, I mean, love, I don't know, hope. Hope is, is not, um, hope, part of, of having hope is being brave, brave to ask those questions that nobody, nobody wants to ask. And, and you know that in, from academia, no? you know that in university when you have these students that are a pain in the neck because they ask the proper questions, but are absolutely brilliant. You want to have them in every single class. Well, we need to, we are as a religious community, we have to be those people to ask those questions and be a pain in the neck for financial institutions, for politicians, because we ask the right questions of where humanity is going, where, um, about the process of decision making, the process of organizing politics, of organizing our business. If we are not brave enough to ask those questions, a little hope, but if we are the community who ask those questions, I'm the experts and the ones who know could be part of the solution, and also the ones, the voices that aren't heard should be part of the solution. Normally, and this is again, St. Paul. St. Paul says, of course, we are all at one body, different parts, everybody's important. But he said, sometimes the least important parts of our body become the most relevant. And this happens the same in society. So because we are ignoring this, oh, the poor and the indigenous people or migrants or, oh, well, this, no, oh, the racial minorities. Oh, well, well, what about if, if we include them, well, maybe we can find new solutions, no? alongside good academic propo uh, proposals like the University of Costa Rica, and also not just in, uh, the university in Costa Rica. I mean, Costa Rica is also an example in terms of, of uh, public policy striving to, to achieve the sustainable development goals and thinking and this, trying to design with all the limitations of hope, but trying to design the politics. Uh, and I'm not saying this because uh, I have my friends from Costa Rica and on the screen, but at least they put the question, you see, on, on the political discussion. Well, what, what do we need to do to, to grow as a country, but respecting our biodiversity, particularly because our biodiversity is, is essential, not just for the world, but for us. So at least we, we can ask those questions. So I think I, my, my message of hope will be if all the communities could be these students that we have in the classrooms <laughs> that are a bit difficult, but are the ones who bring the classroom alive. We are called, I think, in my opinion, it's just my personal opinion, that we are called to be that kind of students in the middle of the political realm, to answer the Dr. Solis question again, no? to be able to, to ask the difficult questions, to, to challenge the, the models that nobody wants to challenge because, yeah, because yeah, we have always talk about this GDP. Well, how do I mean it? But GDP is a good measure because it's simple to measure, but, but even the creators of the GDP, they were saying that this is not a reflection whatsoever of, the, of, the, of a healthy eco, uh, national economy. And now everything about GDP. Well, you see, so we need to start asking questions. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, but the same, the care for this. Is this industry, we are, we are putting a lot of public money, again, going, connecting the public value and the common good with this. Lots of industries are being subsidized. We know that, no? Yeah. Do you agree? Well, and I mean, lots of industries, it's not just the poor who are being subsidized. The fossil fuel industry is one of the most subsidized industries in the world. Well, this is what we have to ask. So I'm not, I don't want, I have nothing against the industry as such, but I said, say, public money, public money, is it, is it worth to invest it, to put it in, to subsidize these kind of industries? Or should, we, or should we subsidize other industries that we need more a bit today? You see, I, I, lots of uh, entertainment industries are subsidized. Well, it could be, but I don't know, should we not subsidize more the health industry? 
I do, it's a question. I'm not saying that has to be like that, but we need to be brave enough to ask the difficult questions. It's a very good conversation to start and one we're not going to finish here, but I really, <laughs> really appreciate all of your comments today um, from both both of our, our speakers. So uh, thank you so much for, 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 for giving us a space to think about these sort of things together. Um, and we do have uh, another one more program tomorrow, uh, one more day of the program tomorrow. So um, we've just put the link to that information in the in the chat. So and also you can find it on the website of the Latin American Caribbean Center. Um, but thank you very much again. Please join me in thanking uh, our, our guests. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Solis. Do you want to uh, do you have anything else to add? No, thank you very much, Whitney. Thank you very much to all the participants. We apologize once again. Time was not enough to uh, answer all your questions. We have uh, Clara Mesa asking why it is that if we're damaging uh, the environment, we continue to do so. Uh, Elizabeth Alves says that acceptable conditions are some in some countries are many times uh, achieved in detriment of countries that are now in measure as living in unacceptable conditions. And there's a very key question, unfortunately we couldn't address it, on, on health, on mental health, which I find is uh, enormously important from Suzanne Frost. We hope that we can address these and other issues tomorrow. Tomorrow we have our session on climate change, migrations and public policy with three great speakers. So thank you, uh, Father Sampini, gracias, gracias uh, Fernando, Dr. Sanchez for your presentation as well. Excellent uh, review of the index. And of course, Whitney, thank you for your moderation and your leadership. To all, to our translators and support staff, thank you very much and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye.